Hi everyone. So we're actually going to go ahead and get started in a new read aloud book. Um, I'm very excited about it. It is historical fiction, which means it has to do with um, history, but it's fake. So it's based on a historical time and the time that it's based on in this book is the Great Depression. Um, however, it is a fake story. So I'm really excited. The book is called Turtle in Paradise, as you can see right here. So I'm just going to go ahead and read the back of the book to you. And then we'll go ahead and we'll get started. It says, life's nothing like the movies. And Turtle knows enough not to expect a Hollywood ending. After all, it's 1935, the Depression. Jobs, money, and sometimes even dreams are scarce. So when Turtle is sent off to Key West, Florida to live with relatives she's never even met, she doesn't even shed a tear. Florida's hot and strange, full of ragtag boy cousins, family secrets, and even buried treasure. Before she knows what's happened, Turtle comes out of the shell she's been spending her whole life building and discovers a world that's more exciting than any Hollywood blockbuster. So I'm pretty excited about this. We're going to go ahead and get started reading. Um, as we read chapter one, I want you guys to think of something called memory moments. And a memory moment is when the author interrupts you to tell you a memory. So sometimes they're going to be obvious memories, like they'll say, you know, this one time I remember, blah, blah, blah. Or sometimes they're not going to be so obvious and you kind of have to use your um, inferring skills to figure out what the memory is. So we're going to read chapter one and then we're going to go over a few memory moments that we find. All right, so as we scroll down, June 1935, you can follow along on the screen. Chapter one, Rotten Kids. Everyone thinks children are sweet as Nako wafers, but I've lived long enough to know the truth. Kids are rotten. The only difference between grown-ups and kids is that grown-ups go to jail for murder. Kids get away with it. I stare out the window as Mr. Edgitt's Ford Model A rumbles along the road, kicking up clouds of dust. It's so hot that the backs of my legs feel like melted gum, only stickier. We've been driving for days now. It feels like eternity. In front of us is a rusty pickup truck with a gang of dirty looking kids in the back sandwiched between furniture, an iron bed, a rocking chair, battered pots, all tied up with little bits of fraying rope, like a spider web. A girl my age is holding a baby that's got a pair of ladies bloomers tied to its head to keep the sun out of its eyes. The boy sitting next to her has a gap between his two front teeth not that this stops him from blowing spitballs at us through a straw. We've been stuck behind this truck for the last few miles, and our windshield is covered with wadded bits of wet newspaper. A spitball smacks the window, and Mr. Edgett hammers the horn with the palm of his hand. The no-good boy just laughs and sticks out his tongue. There ought to be a law. No wonder this country's going to the dogs, Mr. Edgett grumbles. Mr. Edgett you can call me Lyle, has a lot of opinions. He says folks in the Dust Bowl wouldn't be having so much trouble if they just moved near some water. He says he doesn't think President Roosevelt will get us out of this depression and that if you give someone money for not working, why would they even bother to get a job? But mostly, Mr. Edgett Mr. Ed talks about a new he hair serum he's selling that's going to make him rich. It's called Hair Today. And he's, and he's a believer. He's used the product himself. Can you see the new hair turtle? He asks, pointing at his shiny, bald head. I don't see anything. It must grow invisible hair. Maybe Archie should start selling hair serum. If his pal, Mr. Edgett, knows any, if his pal, Mr. Edgett's anything to go by, most men would rather have hair than be smart. Archie's a traveling salesman. He sold everything, brushes, gadgets, Bibles, you name it. Right now, he's peddling encyclopedias. I could sell a trap to a mouse, Archie likes to say, and it's the truth. 
Housewives can't resist him. I know Mama couldn't. It was last May, one day after my 10th birthday, when I opened the door of Mr. Grant of Mrs. Grant's house and saw Archie standing there. He had dark brown eyes and thick black hair, brushed back with lemon pomade. Well, hello there, Archie said to me, tipping his Panama hat. Is the lady of the house at home? Which lady? I asked. The ugly one or the pretty one? He laughed. Why, ain't you a sweet little thing? I'm not sweet, I said. I slugged Ronald Carthewers when he tried to throw my cat in a well, and I'd do it again. Archie roared with laughter. I'll bet you would. What's your name, princess? Turtle, I said. Turtle, huh? He mused, stroking his chin. I can see why. Got a little snap to you, don't you? Who's that you're talking to, Turtle? My mother called, coming to the door. Archie smiled at Mama. You must be the pretty lady. Mama put her hand over her heart. Otherwise, it would have leaped right out of her chest. She fell so hard for Archie that she left a dent in the floor. Mama's always falling in love, and the fellas she picks are like dandelions. One day they're there, bright as sunshine, charming Mama, buying me presents, and the next they're gone, scattered to the wind, leaving weeds everywhere, and Mama crying. But Mama says Archie's different, and I'm starting to think she might be right. He keeps his promises, and he hasn't disappeared yet. Even Smokey likes him, which is saying something, considering she bit the last fella Mama dated. Also, he's got big dreams, which is more than I can say for most of them. Mark my words, Princess, Archie told me. We'll be living on Easy Street someday. That sounds swell to me, but even I know there's going to be a few bumps on the way to Easy Street, and I'm standing right next to one of them. You're like little orphan Annie and her dog, Mr. Edgett says, eyeing Smokey, who's curled up in my lap. You know, Annie's dog. What's its name? How can someone have opinions on baldness and not know the name of Annie's dog? She's the most famous orphan on the radio and in the funny pages. You know, that dog that's always with her. I look out the window. The one that's always barking. Sandy. I say, right. Sandy, he says with a pleased look. What does Sandy say again? Arf, I say. That's good. Sandy says arf, Mr. Edgett chartles. Does your cat say meow? I roll my eyes. What happened to your cat anyhow? He asks with a sidelong glance at Smokey. She's got the mange? She got burned, I said, soothing my hand over Smokey's ragged patches of fur. That's why you call her Smokey? No, I say. The name came first. I still don't understand why you couldn't stay with that old dame, Mr. Edgett says. Place was a mansion. Looked like something Shirley Temple would live in. Shirley Temple is the kid actress everyone's calling America's little darling. She has dimpled cheeks and ringlet curls and is always breaking into song or doing a dance number at the drop of a hat. Everyone thinks she's the cutest thing ever. I can't stand her. Real kids aren't anything like Shirley Temple. And I should know. Because Mama's the housekeeper, we get, we get free room and board. Which wouldn't be so bad, except the rest of the house usually comes with kids. And they're never nice to the housekeeper's daughter. There was 12-year-old Sylvia Decker who gave me her old doll and then told her mother that I stole it from her. We didn't stay there very long. And then there was Josephine Stark, who told all the kids at school that it was my job to clean the toilet. No one would play with me after that. The worst, though, were the curly boys, Melvin and Marvin. They thought it'd be funny to light poor Smokey's tail on fire and watch her run around. Mr. Curly didn't believe me when I told him what his boys did, and he fired Mama on the spot. Like I said, kids are rotten. Mama's promised me that someday we're going to live in our own home. We've got it all picked out, too. It's a Sears mail-order house from a kit. 
the Bellwood model number 3304. This is what the brochure says. A Bellwood is another happy combination of a well laid out floor plan with a modern attractive exterior. The design is an adaptation of a small English cottage. There is a living room, a kitchen, a dining room, two beds, and a bathroom that comes with something called a Venetian mirrored medicine case. I don't know what it is, but it sure sounds fancy. Still, we're a long way from living in the Bellwood. Mama says she's lucky to have a job with Mrs. Budnick, considering how tough times are. I don't know how lucky I am, though. Mrs. Budnick shook her head when Mama brought our things over to her house. You didn't say anything about a child. Children are noise, are noisy. I cannot abide noise, Mrs. Budnick said, tapping her foot. I asked Archie if I could stay with him. Princess, he said, shaking his head. I live in... Oh, hold on. I live in a rooming house with a bunch of other men. I don't think it's exactly the kind of place a young lady should be if you get my meaning. So now I'm on my way to Key West to live with Mama's sister, Minerva, who I've never met. Mr. Eat gets a pal of Archie's, and since he was already going to Miami to meet with a fella about hair today, he offered to give me a ride. Also, he owes Archie a bunch of money. I guess hair today ain't exactly an overnight success. Mama thinks me going to Key West is a swell idea, You'll love it, baby, Mama told me. Mama's good at looking at the sunny side of life. Her favorite song is, Life is Just a Bowl of Cherries. I blame Hollywood. Mama's watched so many pictures that she believes in happy endings. She's been waiting her whole life to find someone who will sweep her off her feet and take care of her. Me? I think life's more like that cartoon by Mr. Disney, The Three Little Pigs. Some big bad wolf's always trying to blow down your house. Ahead of us, the pickup truck is swerving wildly. The kids in the back are clinging to the side. What's that fella doing anyway? Mr. Edgate asks. I think his tire's gone flat, I say. A moment later, the pickup truck pulls off to the side of the road in a cloud of dust. We slow down beside the truck. There's a worn-looking lady in the front seat, staring straight ahead with a drooling toddler asleep on her lap. The fellow behind the wheel is rubbing his eyes. Mr. Edgate calls out the roll-down window. You need help there, buddy? Do we look like we need help? The boy in the back asks. Mr. Edgate shakes his head. Bunch of fools this whole country, he says, and we start to move again. I lean out the window, looking back. The boy blows a spitball, but we've already pulled away. It falls short, landing in the road. So that was the end of chapter one. Real quick, I want to go back to our memory moments when an author interrupts us to tell us a memory. And I wanna just find a few. So the first one that I noticed was a pretty obvious one and it was on page five. So I'm gonna scroll back up to page five. And on page five, it was a pretty obvious memory because it says right here, it was last May, one day after my 10th birthday. So there we know it's obviously not happening right now. It's a memory from last May. So it had happened in the past. So Turtle is reflecting on this memory of when, um, of when Archie first was introduced to her family, which is probably a pretty significant moment because now Archie is actually helping her get to Key West. So that was the first memory that I noticed. The second memory wasn't quite as obvious. However, it was a memory that I wanna point out to you guys and that one was on page 10. So it says, Mama thinks me going to Key West is a swell idea. You'll love it, baby, Mama told me. Mama's good at looking at the sunny side of life. Her favorite song is Life is Just a Bowl of Cherries. So we know that right now, Turtle is in a car with Mr. Edgett and Archie um, and her cat. So she's not in the car with Mama. Um, this memory is more of a subtle memory of her remembering something that her mom said to her and it's not necessarily going on right now. So those are just some skills that as readers, we should really work on to try to find those memories because 
Um, sometimes they're going to be very obvious in your face, sometimes they're not, but either way, they're going to help us um, figure out the character and the plot a little more in depth. So speaking of a character or a plot more in depth, we are going to read chapter two. And as we read chapter two, I want you guys to find a character, a setting, or an event in chapter two that you would like to explain in depth. So you're going to include details from the text. And what I would suggest that you do is you write it down on a piece of paper or you open a Word document or, or go back to the Nearpod and type it as you are listening to this video, as you're listening to chapter two. So we're gonna jump to chapter two. And remember your goal is to find a character, setting, or an event that you can explain in depth and then you are going to explain that character setting or event in depth to me on one of our Nearpod slides. Chapter two, Paradise Lost. I've never been to Easton, Pennsylvania, but according to Mr. Eggett, I'm missing out. Best thing about Easton, Mr. Eggett says, we didn't go in for prohibition like the rest of the country. You could always get a drink in Easton. What is it with folks always talking about where they're from? You could grow up in a muddy ditch, but if it's your muddy ditch, then it's gotta be the swellest muddy ditch ever. Mama's the worst. She's always going on about how Key West is paradise. It's beautiful. The weather's perfect. There's fruit dripping from trees. To hear her talk, you'd think the roads were paved with chocolate like something out of that dumb song that Shirley Temple sings. On the good ship lollipop, it's a sweet trip to a candy shop where bonbons play in the sunny beach of Peppermint Bay. It turns out that getting to Key West is nearly as impossible as getting to Peppermint Bay. There's no road between some of the keys, which are little islands, so we have to wait for a ferry to take the car and us over. It's hours late because of the tide. This is ridiculous, Mr. Eggett grouses. I don't owe Archie a penny more after this trip. When we finally pull into Key West, there's not a bonbon in sight. Truth is, the place looks like a broken chair that's been left out in the sun to rot. The houses are small and narrow, lined up close together, and most of them haven't been painted in a long time. There's a trash, there's trash piled everywhere. It's so hot and humid, it hurts to breathe. What a dump, Mr. Eggett says. But it's the green peeping out everywhere that catches my eye between the houses and the yards and the alleyways. Twining vines, strange umbrella type trees with bright orangey red blossoms, bushes with pink flowers and palm trees. Like mother nature is trying to pretty up the place. She has a long way to go, though. We drive around looking for Curry Lane, which is where Aunt Minnie lives, but Mr. Eggett is about as good at following direction as hair today is at growing hair. Finally, we park next to a little alley so that Mr. Eggett can study the hand-drawn map Mama gave them. I just don't understand where this Curry Lane is, Mr. Eggett says, scratching his bald head. I wish Archie were here. He never gets lost. And he's been just about everywhere. We'll sit with a big map and he'll point out all the places he's been. See Chicago? Folks are smart there. And they like to look good too. Sold a crate of hair pomade in one day, he'll say. Or that little town in North Dakota? Stingiest place I've ever been. Folks there wouldn't buy a button if their pants were falling down. A barefoot boy with big ears looks furtively down the alley. He's wearing overalls with no shirt underneath. Hey kid, Mr. Eggett calls out the window. Can you tell me where Curry Lane is? You're looking at it, the boy says, pointing down the muddy alley. That's Curry Lane, I ask, and the boy nods. Which one's the curry place, Mr. Eggett asks. They're all curries, mister. The boy says, it's Curry Lane. Mr. Eggett gets out of the car and grabs my suitcase. Come on, turtle, he says. At least we're in the right place. 
I pick up Smokey and follow him down the lane. Mr. Eggett stops in front of a house that's so small you could probably sneeze from one side to the other. There's a boy who looks my age, rocking lazily on a porch swing, his feet resting on a sleeping dog. In front of the house is a beat-up child's wooden wagon. Somebody's painted on the side of it. Will work for candy. Excuse me, son, Mr. Eggett calls to the boy. What are you selling, mister? The boy asks, flexing grimy bare feet. He's wearing one of those newspaper boy caps set low on his forehead. Mr. Edgett brightens. Well, since you asked, I do happen to have some hair today, back in my automobile. The dog lifts its head and growls low in, in his throat. It's the funniest looking dog I have ever seen. Like someone crossed a dash hound with a German shepherd. It's all tiny body with a big head. What's it do? The boy asks. Makes your hair grow, Mr. Edgett says, pointing to the top of his head. It's guaranteed to work in a month or your money back. The boy snorts. Guess you ain't a satisfied customer. The dog leaps up, barking like mad. Smokey looks at him like she can't be bothered. She's never been very scared of dogs, just kids. Beans, what's going on out there? A voice shouts from inside the house. A heartbeat later. The screen door slams open, and a woman in a faded striped dress is standing in the doorway, wiping her hands on the front of her apron. She looks like an older version of Mama, except her face is tanner and her hair's pulled back in a flyaway bun. Hush, termite, she orders the dog, who stops barking with a whine. Then she turns to Mr. Eggett. Who are you? He's just some salesman, Mom, the boy says. I'm looking for a Minerva Curry. Mr. Eggett says, I'm Minnie Curry, she says, her eyes widening when she sees me. Why, if you aren't the spitting image of my sister, Sadie Bell. Folks have always told me that I look like my mama. My hair is brown, same as hers, but it's cut short in a bob with bangs, like a soup bowl turned upside down. Mama keeps hers along as good as a dream because that's the way Archie likes it. Our eyes are different, though. I think the color of a person's eyes says a lot about them. Mama has soft blue eyes, and all she sees is kittens and roses. My eyes are gray as soot, and I see things for what they are. The mean boy on the porch has green eyes, probably from all the snot in his nose. That's because she is Sadie's daughter, Miss Ed Mr. Edgett says. I'm Turtle. I say, Turtle? The boy Beans says, what kind of name is that? At least I'm not named after something that gives you gas, I say. Where's your mother? Aunt Minnie asks, looking around. Mr. Eggett waits for me, to, waits for me, or answers for me. In New Jersey, where else would she be? Who are you? Aunt Minnie asks. Mr. Edgett holds out a business card. I'm Lyle Edgett, but you can call me Lyle. Beans hoots with laughter. Egypt? Your name is Egypt? That's a scream, pal. It's not Egypt, kid, Mr. Edgett says, his lips tight. It's Edgett. Got it? Edgett. Whatever you say, Mr. Egypt, Bean says. Mr. Edgett frowns at Beans and says to Aunt Minnie, I'm a friend of Archie's. Who's Archie? Aunt Minnie asks. I'm starting to get that bad feeling I always get right before one of Mama's fellas stops coming around and breaks her heart. The fella's ma the fella Mama's dating, I say. Aunt Minnie looks at me in confusion. I don't understand. Why are you here without your mother? Didn't you get her letter? I ask. What letter? Did something happen to her? Say, Mr. Egypt, Bean says loudly. You been using that hair tonic on your arms? Cause it sure is coming in thick there. That's the final straw for Mr. Eggett. He drops my bag on the porch. The dog leaps up and s with a startled yelp. I'll leave you to your happy reunion, turtle, Mr. Eggett says with a huff and marches down the lane to his automobile. He gets in, guns the engine, and screeches away. So long, Mr. Egypt, Beans calls, laughing. 
Mama wrote you a letter, I say. She got a new job as a housekeeper, and Mrs. Budnick doesn't like children. So she sent you to me? I didn't have anywhere else to go. She looked shocked. For how long? Until we can get a place of our own, I guess, I say. Or until she can get a new job where I can live with her. But Aunt Minnie isn't listening to me. This is just like Sadie Bell. She never thinks, as if I don't have enough already with three kids and a husband who's never home. She looks at Smokey. And you brought a cat? Smokey's a good mouser, I say. She's good at being ugly, is what she is, Bean says. From inside, a young voice calls. Ma, I had an accident. Aunt Minnie closes her eyes and rubs her forehead. Ma, the voice cries again. She turns on her heel, walking through the door without a backward glance. Beans, help your cousin with her bag, she calls over her shoulder. Then it's just Beans and me and the animals. Here, Beans says with a mean smile, picking up my suitcase. Let me help, we, let me help you with your bag, tortoise. He flips it over in one smooth moment, in movement dumping my belongings onto the wooden porch in a heap and sending my paper dolls flying everywhere. Beans walks into the house, the dog running after him, and slams the door so hard and nearly falls off its hinges. That is the end of chapter two. So I want you guys to, um, you can rewind this video a little bit, and I want you to pick a character, setting, or an event that you would like to describe in depth. So you're going to be using a lot of descriptive words, a lot of details from the text, and I will have more instructions on the next slide in the Nearpod. So you're picking a character, setting, or an event that happened in chapter two to describe it in depth.